Welcome to the virtual world of the Eastside Freedom Library. I'm Peter Ratcliffe, the co-executive director. Uh, this meeting is being recorded, so if you're in the witness protection program or trying to stay one step ahead of the CIA, you may want to keep your camera off and put up a dummy name. Um, but for the rest of us, uh, we are here to learn uh, about uh, transnational labor solidarity and the role of the CIA and other nefarious institutions in trying to prevent uh, transnational labor solidarity. Uh, the occasion today is the publication by Pluto Press of our old friend Rob McKenzie's first book. Um, he says it might be his last, but who knows? Um, I've had the honor of knowing Rob probably for 30 years. Um, and he worked it forward, uh, became a union leader in the UAW, um, and uh, continued his career in the UAW after the Ford plant closed uh, here, uh, and has done the research and written this eye-opening book. Uh, we have a great group of people who have read the book and will be raising some questions and thoughts uh, with Rob. Uh, we have an illustrious panel. Uh, we have uh, Gary Prevost, who is joining us uh, from South Africa. Uh, Gary is a retired professor from the College of St. John's and the University of St. Benedict here in Minnesota. Um, but he knew how to get out of here uh, when the temperature in late March is still below freezing. Uh, and so Gary is joining us from South Africa. Uh, we have uh, two great East Siders with us, uh, walking distance from my house, uh, Sarah Degner Riveros, um, who teaches at Augsburg University uh, and is active with the Solidarity Committee of the Americas. Uh, we have Rafael Espinosa, who grew up in Mexico and has been a union activist here in Minnesota uh, with the United Food and Commercial Workers, with AFSCME, uh, now with Teamsters Local 320. Um, and we have Joe Callahan, uh, who worked a long stretch at Ford, uh, then became a bus driver and an activist in the Amalgamated Transit Local, uh, and Joe, like Sarah, is also an activist uh, with the Solidarity Committee of the Americas. And Joe joins us fresh from today's car caravan against the U.S. blockade of Cuba. Um, we're, we're very <laughs> glad that Joe was able to join us without any police interference or any other ways that he might have been interfered with uh, to join us. I also want to give a shout out to my colleague, Bailey Ethier, who is handling the tech today. Um, and again, that is uh, here on Zoom and we're live streaming to Facebook uh, and recording for archiving on YouTube. So um, we have learned that sometimes it's hard for people to show up when an event is taking place and it's really helpful uh, to have a video for people to watch after the fact and to still send comments, thoughts, and questions in. So um, I just want to say uh, personally that the occasion of Rob's book has given me uh, the opportunity to recall, uh, I think when we get to be our age, having prompts uh, for memory can be helpful. And I remember when uh, these events in Kwatitlan took place and a delegation of auto workers from UAW 879 at Ford uh, made a journey to Mexico City to find out what was going on. Uh, and then a delegation from the local uh, in Kwatitlan was invited uh, back to St. Paul. Um, and I, and the big lesson that I remember uh, is that uh, 
these three young Mexican guys arrived. It must have been January or February. It was cold. Uh, they didn't have enough warm clothes. They were staying with Tom Laney, who was the president of Local 879 at the time. Uh, Tom was about their size. Uh, and they showed up for a big meeting in the chapel at McAllister College wearing sweatshirts that Tom, who was and still is, I suspect, a kind of Irish nationalist, uh, Tom had given them sweatshirts to wear. Uh, one said Notre Dame. One, I believe, said Kiss Me, I'm Irish. Uh, and it inspired the three Mexican guys to ask us in the audience at McAllister College, what did we know about the San Patricios? And as a PhD in American history and an already tenured professor at McAllister College, I had to admit that I knew nothing. And they explained to us that there had been a group of Irish immigrants unemployed in 1848 who had joined the US military uh, to try to support themselves and their families, found themselves in Texas in the middle. And it's hard not to stop and think, this sounds like Russia and Ukraine. The United States had invaded Texas, uh, which claimed to be an independent nation, kind of like Donbass and the other part of Ukraine that is Putin's excuse for invading. Um, and uh, when they got there, they, they figured out that they had more in common with the Mexicans than they did with the American military. And they defected and fought on the side of the Mexicans. They were captured by the US military. They were put on trial and they were executed. And the punchline from these three young Mexican guys was that they were the only white people buried in the Mexican National Cemetery. Years later, Rye Cooter would make a recording about the San Patricios. Um, but we got our story directly from these three young Mexican auto workers. So transnational labor solidarity can be a great learning opportunity, uh, as well as a way to build worker power. So I appreciated being reminded of that story. And Rob has done remarkable research, uh, peeling away the layers and finding out what else lay behind it. So the plan today is Rob is going to present a PowerPoint. Uh, then we're going to hear from Sarah, Raphael, Gary, and Joe. Uh, Rob will have a little bit of time to respond. And, and then we will open up. You are welcome in the audience to uh, type questions and comments into the chat. If you're out there in Facebook land, you can use the Facebook comment function. Um, or if we remain a nice friendly group, we can just unmute and have a conversation. So I'm going to get out of the way and turn things over to Rob McKenzie and Bailey, who is going to be handling the tech of the PowerPoint. Um, we're a, a number of us are kind of, whether we're Luddites or dinosaurs or what the right, but, but this is a challenging technological world that we now live in. Rob, take it away, please. Well, thanks so much for hosting me, Peter. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank the panelists for reading the book and spending their time here this afternoon, too. Um, when, as Peter said, I was working at the Ford assembly plant here in St. Paul in 1990, when our local heard about the attack on workers at a Ford plant near Mexico City, where nine were wounded. You want to start the PowerPoint? I think. Our local union, along with several others in the US and really many around the world, did support work for the dissident group there called the Ford Workers Democratic Movement. Next. 
1996, I was attending a meeting of the Coalition for Justice in the Maquiladoras in Brownsville and Matamoros. And at the conclusion of that meeting, a staff person for the newly elected president of the AFL CIO, John Sweeney, came up to me and told me that they believed that the American Institute for Free Labor Development had been involved at these events at the Quetitlan Ford plant. And I asked him, well, aren't they linked to the CIA? And he nodded his head. So when I got back to Minnesota, I tried to follow that up. I got absolutely nowhere. I just got doors slammed in my face. So when I retired in 2016, I had some time, I had some contacts in labor, and I determined to find out what happened there. Want to do the next one? Next slide. OK, the next one after that. During the 1980s, uh, Mexico was in a really serious economic and political crisis. Uh, a lot, they had discovered oil and done a lot of social spending based on oil revenues and future oil revenues. And when the world economy collapsed into recession and the price of oil fell, Mexico was thrown into a really deep economic crisis, uh, unemployment, devaluation of the peso, inflation got as high as triple digits. In 1985, a serious major earthquake hit Mexico City and that economic crisis turned into a political crisis. Next slide. In 1998, Cuauhtemoc Cardenas, he'd been the son of a famous general of the Mexican Revolution and a very popular president of Mexico, split from the PRI and challenged the, the Institutional Revolutionary Party, which had ruled Mexico for 65 years, challenged their economic policies. The PRI had begun adopting neoliberal pro-business reforms to deal with the economic crisis. So Cardenas's coalition included socialists and communists. And in that 1988 election, which is today widely believed to have been massively fraudulent, the government appointed, declared Carlos Salinas the winner, though the ballot boxes had been seized by the military and a couple of years later they were burned. So Cardenas, I just saw a video recently, he said only 45% of the votes were ever even counted in that election. Okay, now we can go on to John Negroponte, the next slide. So within weeks of this Mexico election conclusion, a new diplomatic and intelligence team was assigned to Mexico. So the new ambassador would be John D. Negroponte, who had been active as ambassador to Honduras, supporting the Contras and really to avoid Congress. Congress had passed a law saying we could not fund the, the Contras. Negroponte got the Honduran government to back him and then got massive aid for Honduras. Okay, next, next guy is Robert Pastorino. I had never heard of him before. He's, you can see his national security background there. While he was in Mexico, he wrote the first conceptual draft of NAFTA. And Negroponte in later interviews said his main accomplishment in the assignment to Mexico was facilitating negotiations for NAFTA between Bush and Salinas. So you can see the relationship between NAFTA and the National Security Committee in these assignments. Okay, now we can go on to Ford. Next slide. So during this time of uh, economic crisis in Mexico, the auto companies began investing in new production facilities in the north of Mexico. GM was the first, Chrysler win, and then Ford built two new plants on the near the Mexican border for export. Now, the Mexico City plant, the Cuatitlan plant, was doing production for the domestic market. And with economy in such bad shape, um, they really were fighting to align their wages and benefits, which were quite a bit better with the new Northern plants. Both all of these plants were represented by the Confederation of Mexican Workers or the CTM we'll call it. And they had quite a reputation for being corrupt and subservient to employers. In 1987, it became time to negotiate a new labor agreement at the Cuatitlan plant. 
and sales are down. They had a lot of extra people. This is something we went through at our Ford plant. When that happens, a layoff comes. So what happened in this situation is the CTM and Ford agreed on a plan. Ford wouldn't match the 27% wage increase the government had authorized, and then the CTM would call a strike, except Ford would pay half the wages of the workers, which seemed like a good deal. But there's a problem. there was a problem with it. Under Mexican labor law, after three months, an employer can terminate their labor agreement. And after four months, Ford terminated the labor agreement, in effect, firing everybody in the plant. Um, a new contract was eventually ratified, and then the workers came to work, returned to work. But as part of this new contract, there was a two-tier wage scale, and everybody was hired back at the new lower tier, and something they did not expect or know about it. And that resulted in approximately a 40% wage and benefit cut for all the workers in the plant who were rehired. Uh, 600 people also were never recalled. Now, this contract and the leadership of the CTM that negotiated it had opposition in the plant. There were several left groups and parties organizing in the plant at this time. The most successful was the Revolutionary Workers Party. Uh, the Partido Revolucionario Trabadores is what PRT stands for. And after the 1987 contract was rammed down everyone's throat, they were in firm control of the local union. And they, they really started doing a lot of aggressive um, negotiating, democratizing the union, really involved in a lot of activities that gained a reputation throughout Mexico. They were getting a lot of attention. Okay, next one. Next slide. In July of 1989, the head of the Ford CTM, which included all the Ford plants, was up for election. He had been appointed in 1987. His name was Hector Arte, and he was going to have to run for election in July of 89. And the local leaders at Cuautitlan planned to challenge him for that position, and they were quite certain they were going to win just because of the size of their local compared to these newer plants on the border. About a few weeks before that July election, Ford fired four of the six uh, local committee members, really everybody who would have been able to challenge Urarte. Urarte was easily reelected, and then the struggle really began in earnest. That's when the Ford Workers Democratic Movement was organized. Uh, next slide. The fired executive committee members continued to operate for the leadership of the local. They still were making the decisions and uh, holding meetings. And they did a lot of things in this summer and fall. Uh, they had a hunger strike. They had protest marches, trying to draw attention to what was happening at the Ford plant. And then in December, a major problem developed at the plant. Ford, and this is the Ford I know, and, and in trying to help your Arte's election didn't withhold any taxes from the annual profit sharing bonus. So it was much, much bigger than it would normally be. And thinking, well, if people are happy with the status quo, they're more likely to support your Arte. Well, that really didn't work and they had to fire the people anyway. But when December came, they took out all those taxes. And a lot of people had no paycheck or tiny little paychecks. And they suspected the money had been embezzled. Nobody had ever communicated to them what had happened with the taxes. So they walked out of the plant and blocked a, a highway, called the press, and elected a commission to negotiate with Ford and the CTM. Ford only had to negotiate with the national CTM. They did not have to negotiate with the local. Why don't we try the next slide here? Now, after they walked out of the plant in December, the CTM agreed to meet with the leaders in the commission on January 8th of 1990. So once that agreement had been reached, the workers agreed to return to work on January 3rd after the Christmas holiday shutdown. They had one similar to what we had here in the US. Wait, next one. On January 5th, local leaders, this is after everyone come back to work, came to the plant to hand out a leaflet asking workers to come to this meeting with the CTM. They were kidnapped 
by a group of 30 thugs with guns. When the workers in the plant learned about this, they stopped work and started a sit down strike. And that was on a Friday. By the end of the day on Friday, all those kidnapped leaders had been released. Everybody went home for the weekend. On Sunday evening, the local leaders got word from inside the plant that strange people were coming into the plant. Some of them were wearing Ford uniforms and they expected that that group would be there in the morning. So the leaders formed a plan, a, a plan about what to do, which looked like a, a confrontation in the morning. Now that night, late that night, several hundred in the book, I call them golpeadores. That means like thugs who were involved in a coup gathered outside the plant. They were under the leadership of a gangster named Wallace de la Mancha, which all the papers reported in the next couple of days. They went into the plant at night before the shift started. And when the workers came in that morning, a fight erupted, provoked by these thugs. Now, what I was able to learn what had happened, Ford was going to fire the 10 leaders of the Friday work stoppage. These golpeadores came in to stop another work stoppage. That's what I believe was happening. Um, so a fight broke out. They felt cornered. The golpeadores opened fire with guns, wounded nine people, and one of them later died. But the workers were able to drive them out of the plant. That's a good slide there for this one. The workers decided to occupy the plant and issued some demands, including the fire, the rehiring of the fired executive committee members, the straightening the payout from December, and they demanded holding a national democratic Congress on labor rights in Mexico. So they occupied the plant for two weeks before they were driven out by 2000 police. But the strike continued. Once they got them out of the plant, the strike continued. And even by mid-February, only about 1,000 out of 3,800 people had come back to work. So Ford got permission from the government to terminate the contract and fire everybody who didn't come back to work. And even then, they only got around 2,500 people back. 600 were never called back and fired. But even the 2,500 were wearing armbands, black armbands, and supporting the people still out in the street. So finally, Ford and the CTM sat down with the local leaders and negotiated an end to this. It wasn't very good, but the, they didn't have a lot of options at this point. And like I said, 600 people were, were fired. Okay, next slide. Let's get to Guadalupe. Yeah, there he is. Okay, um, Guadalupe Uribe was, he did six months in prison for the attack. And he was a lieutenant for the gangster Wallace de la Mancha. Mancha, who I couldn't find a picture of, a very mysterious person, died a few months after this, mysteriously, probably assassinated. I, you know, I believe, and I think the fair amount of evidence that he was a CIA contract agent, Wallace de la Mancha. So why, how I got to that point and what my evidence is, I'd be happy to get into. But the documents I found do show the American Institute for Free Labor Development was involved in these events. So now we can go on to the next slide. I started researching AFELD, and I finally decided that if I could figure out who this Bill Doherty was, I could figure out what AFELD was. Uh, no question in my mind, I devote a fair amount of space to him. He was a career CIA agent. Uh, Phil Agee, first time I really decided this had to be the case, Phil Agee wrote about him in his book, Inside the Company's CIA Diary. He said, yeah, he was, a, he was a CIA agent, and I worked with him directly on a CIA project in 1960 in Ecuador. So now, okay, yeah, next slide. Now, this individual, Joe Bierne, who was officially credited with the idea for AFELD by top AFL-CIO officials, including Kirkland. So yeah, he, he, he started a 1958 prototype trip of what AFELD became, where he got a group of Latin American communication workers and brought them back to the CWA training center in Front Royal, Virginia. Um, he also, in his book, AG, lists him as a top CIA collaborator. And one point, 
and another as an agent in the postal, a CIA agent in the Postal Telephone and Telegraph International. So there's him with Walter Ruther in 1962. Now, Bierne had a 66 meeting after Victor had gone public with Afeld's ties to the CIA and AFL CIO, introduced a motion condemning Victor Ruther at an AFL CIO Executive Council meeting. And shortly after that, well, sh after that meeting, after he had his executive board meeting, Ruther pulled out of the AFL CIO and started a rival labor federation. So now we can go on to the next slide. And that included the Teamsters and the chemical workers, but that did not last long. That ended with this crash. And that's another thing I really hesitated. I did not know there was a mystery to the death of Walter Ruther when I started. I was just tracing the debate over Afeld and the AFL CIO. But the more you look at this, I, I, there's no way you can look at this as not an assassination. The NTSB did a really good investigation of it and found the altimeter was reading 200 to 250 feet higher than the plane was that day. A similar accident had happened in 68 with Ruther and, and Dulles Airport, they crashed. They lived through that one. The, the runway lights were shut off just before he landed in 1970. And the runway he was supposed to land on had approach path lights, which would have told the pilot the angle they were coming in and at their altitude. Those got switched off right before they landed. So they had to land on another runway that didn't have those lights and they had to rely on the altimeter. So, you know, there's, I'm still finding out more about that. So another character I wanted to mention in the CIA involvement in labor was, of course, Jay Lovestone, extremely inter interesting and important person in AFL-CIO foreign policy. He was, uh, he'd been fighting with the Ruthers since the mid thirties when he was involved in a internal dispute where they tried to purge the communists out of the UAW in the thirties. And the Ruthers sided with the communists in that and Victor got fired. So that's this debate continued all through the sixties. Lovestone had a close personal relationship with James Angleton, who was the chief of counterintelligence of the CIA. And Angleton was able to keep the fact out that they were paying Lovestone, even from other people in the CIA, until the mid-70s when a new director did an investigation. So Jay Lovestone, very interesting character. Next slide and the last slide here, and we can move on. Um, and I, I think and I did not start it out thinking I was going to study the role of the CIA and the AFL CIO, but I had to to find out what AFELD was. And I believe that the AF, the CIA was running AFL CIO foreign policy directly with agents for most of the Cold War. We had two international affairs directors, all of these institutes like AFELD or the Asian American Free Labor Institute or the African American Labor Center or the Regional Organization of Workers, all run by career CIA agents. So I think you can really see this and what the effects of it were in a study of what happened at Quetitlan. And that's what we've attempted to do in our book. So I'll conclude with that. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much. Um, so now we're going to move into four commentaries and questions. Uh, from people who have read the book. And again, I hope that everybody out there is making note of questions that you would like to ask. Um, and I'd like to start with Rafael Espinosa. Uh, Rafael, you want to go first, please, brother? Yes, Peter. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, one of the things that, I mean, to me, it, it, it's incredible that somebody from the United States is writing a book that is so explicit about what happened in Mexico and they were people in Mexico are not doing that. You know, it's, it, to me, that's, that's incredible. Uh, but one of the things that I wanted to say that uh, all of the shenanigans that happened there uh, and the involvement of the CIA, it also has repercussions here in the United States because whenever we organize in people, especially from Mexico, they work here in the United States, they always, make the association the the unions here are like the unions in Mexico that they're tied to the government and they're tied to you know to really 
uh, uh, shady elements of society and that it's all corrupted. So it makes, for us, it makes it very difficult to, you know, to say, no, that's not what happens here. You know, but this is the kind of the mentality that people have because of all these things that happen down there. And, and you know, I really appreciate, you know, Brother Rob to put the, putting this book out there. Um, uh, and I guess, what, you know, one of the questions that, that I have for him is, uh, is, I mean, do you feel, you feel like there's going to be repercussions for this book? Because that's, you know, to me, that's the first thing that I think when, whenever somebody puts the truth out, out there, like the way he did. Should I answer that now or wait till? Sure, the go ahead, Rob. Yeah, you, you and I both know labor and you know this is the way it operates. I do too. I have had friends for people I've known 20 years or more and I know they share a lot of my values have absolutely stopped talking to me once they found out I was working on this. And more than one, more than two, more, more than five. Let's put it all. I've, you know, there's really, there's really, you know, and I, but at this point I'm retired. There's really not that much they can do to me, but I did, I was worried about legal action and I have taken a lot of legal steps. And one of the reasons it took so long to get it published is I, I made, wanted, made sure I had a publisher who would hang with me through that. So I'm glad to see somebody here from labor because I know that not encouraged to attend people from labor. And I appreciate your question. And I, there's not much they can do to me now. <laughs> uh, unlike yeah. the people in Mexico who really, uh, you know, still, you don't know what's going to happen to you if you stick your neck out. Mm -hmm. I know. And, you know, I was, I was born and raised in Mexico. And mm -hmm. I really appreciate this book because it, it tells the truth exactly, you know, exactly what went on and a lot of the things still going on. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that, that, that I also really appreciate, you know, from your book is that you also make the connection with other countries. That is not, the, the Mexico was not the only one that they had in their side. They're, they're actually were doing that all over the place. But I know there's more people on the panel. So I, you know, I want to, you know, I want to give them, a, a, you know, their time too. But another thing that I, that I wanted to say is that this is, uh, this is how we change the world, right? We're talking about the truth. Uh, there are some, you know, horrible things that are going on in the world with the, you know, with labor, uh, but this is how we change it. We got to be honest about what happened in order not to continue, you know, this stupidity that has happened in the past. That's exactly right. That's, uh, you've got to, international workers solidarity has to become a core value of the labor movement or it's not going to survive. And the only way to do that is confront what has happened in the past, honestly and openly. Great. Well, so speaking of international labor solidarity and countries in addition to Mexico, why don't we go next to Gary Prevost, uh, who is coming to us from South Africa today? Gary, you're up. It, fascinating book. I first uh, learned in detail about Eiffeld uh, doing Chile solidarity work in the early 1970s. Um, that's when we became fully aware of the role that Eiffeld was was playing in the in the Chilean situation, which which you discussed. They you know they played a role in the uh, supposed strike, actually lockout by the truckers that uh, totally disrupted the country. And then following you know my next large uh, solidarity work was throughout the 80s related to Central America. And again, there, that's where we, again, the issue of Eiffeld was discussed, it was brought up. Um, and I'm also struck by the fact that you, your book deals with some stuff that happened here in Minnesota, where we took this directly into the labor movement. We took this directly into the labor movement to expose it at that time and to get generally progressive unions like the UAW, um, Union at, at St. Paul to take a stand against this um, move of, a, of, of Eiffel. Because by the, in some sense, by the 1980s, um, the anti-communism that had been at the root of this when the AFL-CIO comes together in the 50s, creates Eiffel in the 60s, that was starting to break down. 
definitely among labor activists. Sure, there were still bureaucrats, and you talk about this fellow Gustafson who leads the group down there. But I'm struck by the fact that there was really a lot of pushback against AFEL um, within the labor movement at that time. Um, and, and the very fact that, you know, it, it's discontinued in 1996. I mean, it's, it's an organization that sort of had partly outlived its usefulness because the, the Cold War context of it had, 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 had completely uh, broken down. Just a quick comment about Mexico. Right, I wasn't as familiar in, in that sense. My own take on Mexico um, is that they didn't need the CIA to do what they did at that Ford plant. That was, that was just straight out of the playbook of the pre. That was straight out of um, what they did the minute they started to be seriously challenged by youth activists in the 1960s and the massacre in Mexico City prior to the Mexico City games, the challenge to any independent labor union that would arise that wasn't the CTM because of the corporatist system that existed in Mexican politics was severely repressed. Uh, Peter, remember, I think there was a, a bus drivers union that uh, was yes. a, with, with, a, with a number of 100 that was that mm -hmm. was very active and just anything that was outside that that operated outside the framework of the the CTM and the PRI was viewed as the mortal enemy and, and therefore available to be assassinated and killed without, uh, with, without uh, any, uh, any question. You may well be right that um, there was CIA involvement in the background of this, but my view would be they didn't need the CIA for the playbook on this one. Mm -hmm. They probably would have done it even if the United States hadn't existed. So can I respond to that one? Please go right yeah, ahead. No, I think that's a, a good question. The, uh, the cover story for this became by the, from the State Department and Ford when they talked to the embassy was that this was an interunion dispute between the CTM and these dissidents. Well, I was always skeptical about that from being in labor unions. What they pulled off to get 300 people willing to commit violence armed with submachine guns, pistols, walkie-talkies, into the a location, none of them had cars, in the middle of the night, have, be organized enough to get them into five groups. There were five different buildings, and they went into all five buildings and maintained a presence at the gate was beyond the capacity of the CTM. They're a thuggish union. They beat people up, and they could bring gangsters to this and that, but this was a paramilitary operation. Now. The other problem with saying the CTM did it was two days after this happened, the head of the Auto Workers Federation of the CTM held a press conference and demanded an investigation of Wallace de la Mancha, who was the gangster the paper said had been in charge of this thing. Now, if the CTM had been the, the main force organizing him, that that press conference never would have happened. Now, there were definitely people in the CTM involved, a few anyway. And then the other thing is the CTM sent someone to Congress where the PRI only had a 10 vote margin after the 88 election. And they actually lost that election. So they did not really have the political power to pull this off with the Congress the way it was. So anyway, the CTM told Congress, we didn't do this, they denied it and they, reference vague, mysterious forces out there who do this kind of thing. So that, and then the documents that show Hector Arte meeting with the CIA in Washington a year previously. Mm -hmm. And they felt documents linking a named individual who I'm sure whose father was a CIA agent before him to the events at Quetitlan. So again, the thing about having La Mancha disappear, probably assassinated. Well, there is no evidence. I mean, that's why they get these kind of people. If things go bad, they can assassinate him. So those are my thoughts on it. But uh, it, it wouldn't have been because the PRI didn't want to do that to him. Of course, they did. So that's my thoughts. I, I just want to add I'm in. Not, oh, go ahead. Yeah, Gary, please. The, C, the CTM did it, but that there, yeah. are, there are links within the Mexican government and the ability to do 
to, to do repression and make people disappear um, during that period, especially of the PRT, was legendary. And I, I really don't think that it, uh, they, yes, they were chastened by having in reality lost that election, but it didn't really change their running of the country. And to the degree that the US and the CIA may have assisted them, I, I would agree, but I, I still would say that the, that government was deeply involved. I, I just wanted to jump in and say, um, let's not let Ford off the hook. Uh, let's not get so focused on, was it the CTM? Was it the CIA? Um, but those armed gunmen could not have gotten into the plant if Ford had not allowed them into the plant. There was no report of uh, security guards being overwhelmed uh, at entrances to the plant. So, you know, the, the, the role of multinational capital is, is a very important part. Uh, of of this whole story, um, let me let me turn to Joe Callahan and um, Joe. What 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 do you have to contribute, please? Okay, well, uh, I think the first third of Rob's book about the Afeld is a real contribution. Uh, that story is, I don't think is well known, and the AFL CIO's collaboration with the CIA to help undermine unions and workers' movements in other countries. It's a particularly scurrilous and self-destructive chapter in U.S. labor history. The U.S. government intervenes militarily and with CIA attacks all over the world, uh, but with particular aggressiveness here in the Western Hemisphere, think uh, Monroe Doctrine. And the collaboration by unions in this is the polar opposite of any kind of working class solidarity to advance the interests of working people. The struggle by workers in Quautitlan at the Ford plant was a remarkable and courageous battle, I think. They were going up against powerful forces, starting with Ford, one of the largest manufacturing companies in the world. Ford of Mexico was the third largest company in Mexico at that time. And they also faced the Mexican government and the Union Federation, which was tied in with it, and the U.S. government with... Uh, UAW President Owen Bieber as a, on the board of directors of AFIELD at that time, so he was working with the CIA. The ambassador to Mexico, John Negroponte, who's like the Darth Vader of the State Department, as, as Rob mentioned, so he was ambassador to Honduras in the middle 80s during the Contra War, and he was the ambassador to Iran in 2005 at the height of the uh, resistance to the U.S. occupation there. And I don't think it was accidental that he happened to be the uh, ambassador to Mexico at the time. In the face of these forces, the, the workers fought very hard and very creatively, too, I think. Um, and if there was widespread struggle like that, workers could accomplish quite a lot, I think. And as Rob points out in the book, the Union Local Executive Committee from the mid-'80s had a a lot of members of the uh, Partido Revolucionario de los Trabajadores, the PRT. I lived in Phoenix, Arizona in the early 70s, in the late 70s, I should say. And I had interactions with them uh, while I was there. For example, in 1980, I helped host and organize a speaking tour for Rosario Ibarra Piedra, that Rob talks about in the book, a human rights campaigner. Wow. His son had been kidnapped and murdered. Uh, and in 1982, she was the PRT candidate for president of Mexico. Now, a couple thousand miles north of Cuauhtitlan, here in, in uh, Twin Cities Assembly Plant, we got some of the first news of the struggle from an activist worker named Bert Rubash, who was on the internet almost before there was an internet. There was no social media, no videos, no smartphones. But there were a couple of sites that had some news of labor struggles that you wouldn't get in corporate media. And he brought to our attention after the shooting on, on January 8th of 1999, 1990. And promptly after that, Tom Laney, the recording secretary, and Jose Quintana, 
a bilingual union member, flew down there and began the process of solidarity from our local. And we went on to speak, as people have said, to speak, sponsor speaking engagements here in Twin Cities and labor meetings and other places. Peter talked about McAllister. And Tom Money told me he, he thought that they had an invitation to Kansas City as well. Now, I'm going to quibble with Rob on one point in the book, not so much here today, but I, th I thought in the book that he kind of downplayed the role of, of Ford in that attack in the plant. Peter, I agree with Peter that, that Ford was up to their eyeballs and giving out uniforms and, and badges. And in the book, Rob quotes uh, an unnamed official telling Ted LaValle, the union chairman here, that the people came there to talk to the workers. Well, gunfire is pretty loud. It's pretty hard to talk over it, especially if you're on the receiving end of the bullets. So I think Ford was clearly up to their eyeballs in it, along with the Mexican Union and government and the US government. A couple of years later in 1993, there was a conference of workers and activists from US, Canada, and Mexico that myself and I don't remember if we had two carloads of people or, or just one that went, went uh, down to that in Juarez, Mexico, one of the, I think the largest uh, city on the Mexican border, uh, two and a half million people across from El Paso, Texas. And that border is the only land border in the world between a imperialist country and a third world country. And that generates a lot of issues with immigration and trade. And the idea of the conference was to bring workers together from all three countries in North America to build solidarity, which is uh, the right direction to go. Now, there was an incident that uh, I think underlined how challenging that is. Uh, Mexicano participant talked about immigrant rights and called for open borders. And I overheard some of the Canadian workers there angrily talking among themselves saying, they want to just come and take the jobs. Another memorable experience from that event, we visited Immaculadora, a classical type of one where subcomponents were manufactured in the US, shipped to the border, and then assembled by low paid workers. I was surprised they even let us in. But it was a plant making wire harnesses for the auto industry. The workers had these big tables, uh, big piles of wires uh, on tables. The workers in these plants were women in their teens and 20s from rural towns in the interior of Mexico. We heard a presentation at that conference about women being abducted, raped, and killed at night on the way home. And the number at that time was around nine or 10, I believe. And I was taken back about eight or 10 years later when I was handed a leaflet about this still going on. And the number then was over 400. And there's people organizing solidarity demonstrations here in the US, including here. And, and uh, I attended a protest and was pleased by the turnout. There's hundreds of people marching in the streets here in Twin Cities in solidarity. And in recent years, there's been a movement among women uh, protesting murders in Mexico uh, of, of women, which they call femicides. Um, in Rob's book, he notes the decline in human, union membership in the US. It's down to single digits in the private sector. But I think there's been some signs of life lately with strikes by teachers, including here in Minneapolis, and last year there were strikes uh, by some miners and strikes by auto workers at uh, John Deere and three years ago at General Motors. So I, I was also found it heartening to see the victorious union representation, representation election at Starbucks in Buffalo a little while back. And the woman that organized that said Eugene Debs was one of her heroes. And I believe there's some books of his Side Freedom Library. That's all. Thank you, Joe. So 
Rob, I, please can, go can ahead. I respond to the issue of Ford? Because I think at the time yeah. this happened, we all believed that Ford was behind this, though it was certainly not anything they had done since the 30s, was used violence against their own workers and their own plants. I, I think the, the really the critical document I found were the embassy cables, which I got through a Freedom from Information Act. And two days after this happened, Ford went to the embassy to tell them what happened. In that cable, the embassy says, Ford said these attackers were members of the Revolutionary Workers Party who had come in the plant to intimidate their workers. Totally untrue. And it would totally be dispelled within another day but then they also told them they were going to fire these 10 leaders of the Friday work stoppage. But they didn't say that. They told the embassy, well, there were some non-Ford employees we wanted to get out of the plant. So we called the police in to remove them. And they, they, Ford tells the embassy, we don't know why the police didn't stop these attackers, these PRT attackers. They were totally confused about what happened that day. Now, I actually have that cable as part of the slideshow. If you guys want to take the time, maybe is Bailey still here? Oh, yeah, she's running the show. If you guys want to look at that, we can put that cable up. That was the next document after the last photo. Bailey, can you can you find that and do that? Yes, I most certainly can. This was a big breakthrough when I got these cables because I figured that they were worried about the left in this plant, but this proved it. So it's the next one. This one. All right. Oh, no, that's the that's the flight document. Well, let's take a look at this while we're here, because this is a group that's interested in this kind of thing. This is a flight document from the assistant director of the International Affairs Department of the AFL-CIO, who had previously been the AFL head in Mexico, a guy named Paul Samoji, who gave me a long email interview. Mm. Um, so the, on that flight, you can see passengers confirmed for this flight. This is in November of 88, right after the 88 election. So Tom Donahue, Secretary Treasurer of the AFL-CIO, Owen Bieber, President of the UAW, Steve Beckman, who was in the International Affairs Department staff of the UAW, who also gave me a long phone interview. We'll skip number four. Number five didn't show up. Number six was Mark Anderson, another International Affairs Department staff for the AFL-CIO. And three to four Mexican auto workers, you see Hector Urarte at Ford there, right? He was on the plane. Both Beckman and Anderson gave me very long phone intermails. They did not meet with these Mexicans in Washington at this time. And Donahue and Bieber couldn't have met with them without their staff people there who knew how to deal with this situation. So that leaves one guy, number four, William Doherty, who I spent a long time researching, convinced he was a CIA, career CIA agent. He is who met with the Mexicans. All right, next document here. Let's get onto the, the embassy cable. They were flying to another meeting in San Diego. That's what this was about. Okay, so here it is. Labor strife at Ford plant. So that was good. They could almost, can you guys read that or should? She can blow it up. Yeah. All right, there we go. So there they say, okay, 10 workers suspended. The, the workers were reportedly planning. Okay, no, this is. Okay, let's go on to the next page because that I want to see where Ford says they're in this. Okay, let's go back. That's the that's the one from. Laney's letter to Negroponte, they responded with a cable to the Secretary of State. Let's go back one. Yeah. Okay, so I didn't get the one in about Ford saying it's the PRT. Okay, all right, well, let's just go on to uh, whatever the last one was. Oh, the other one is about Local 879. So I didn't get the one where Ford says it was the PRT. No, okay. I do not have that. No, I must not have put it in there. I was just my memory is faulty. Go ahead to the next one. All right. Well, now that last one did have what I was looking for. I, I'm sorry to get so confused here, but we'll go back. Okay, here it is. Now, can you scroll down on that one? Any at all? 
No. Okay, so allegedly diversion of payroll deductions. Okay, I'm sorry. Let's go on to the last one and we can get into uh, responding to 879. So there you see Laney wrote Negroponte a letter asking for his help getting these at Ford Workers Democratic Movement people up to Minnesota. So here is Negroponte telling James Baker, well, we thought we should bring this to your attention, the invitation from UAW 879 in St. Paul. This is a legitimate activity, but it has the potential downside in terms of relationships with the CTM. Very concerned about the CTM now is blaming this for causing the problem, which everybody involved knows that's not the truth. But, you know, labor solidarity is always a good fall guy. Um, number three there, Mike Verdu, recently returned to AFELD from his ORIT post, is well versed in the complex labor relation problems at Ford, which involve, and as, as he expects, Baker knows. So Verdu was the guy, his father was a guy named Angelo Verdu, who'd come from Spain and was a, a professional anti communist, is how he described himself in one of the interviews I have. And so his son now is an AFELD employee who was in charge of CTM. So it talks a little bit about the, uh, the relationship with the government there. And then if you want to go into the next paragraph, I think you can scroll down to the next paragraph if people, oh, there's no more there. Okay. Oh, that's too much, because that one got cut off too. But the, he tells um, the Secretary of State, Baker, you need to contact Bill Doherty and let him know about what's going on at Local 879. Yeah. So again, that raises the specter they were using them to suppress dissent. Yeah. So I got 11 of these cables. It was I couldn't really put them all in here, but I think that really gave me a different perspective on what was going on here. Now, it wasn't that Ford was innocent. I mean, I recount the story of their security guards taking an activist out and have him dig a grave and threaten him and interrogate him while he's digging a grave and asking him, do you know who this grave is for? Uh, Uribe, the guy whose picture, who was a, a picture was in the slides, who was a lieutenant for Mancha, was hired after he got out of prison. He was hired as the transportation manager of Ford of Mexico. Um, Janet G. Mullins, who was assistant secretary of state, who dealt with Wellstone on this, mm. as soon as she got out of that job, she became a vice president of Ford Motor Company. So it's not that Ford Motor Company was innocent in what happened here. They just weren't the, the people who organized the attack that spiraled into gunfire. That's what I believe. OK, thank you, Rob. Um, why don't we move on? Um, Sarah, Sarah Degna Riveros, you're up. Thank you, Rob. Uh, it's been an honor to read your book. And thank you for sharing with us, sharing it with us and bringing to light what happened at the Ford Cuatitlan plant, um, Ford plant, um, and giving us the broader context of labor history in Latin America and for the gripping narration of events that tra transpired uh, as part of this coup at Ford and the workers strike and occupation of the Ford plant. I wanna start out by saying that I teach uh, Spanish language, literature and writing, I teach poetry. And so this is um, pretty far outside uh, of my field of expertise. And um, I'm really glad to hear from Rafael and Gary and Joe who know a great deal about labor and about organizing in Latin America. Um, and uh, I appreciate how your book is accessible even to someone like me. Um, I really appreciate that you offered a helpful summary of important history that was uh, aimed for a layperson reader to understand in ways that the CIA has intervened in labor throughout Latin America in the past. Um, and I think this matters to us here in the United States because um, in, your, in your book on page 106, you say that as of 2010, one in four automobiles imported into the United States had been assembled in Mexico. And um, so, um, uh, your book carefully points out the violent history of the CIA intervening in labor movements to root out any form of communism through terrorism and violence. So that by page 60, as I was making a list uh, in the front of the book of um, uh, violent murders, I got, I ran out of room. Um, uh, 
writing those down. And so I believe uh, that capitalism makes us unwittingly complicit in violence, exploitation, and extraction of resources. Um, that happens in really insidious ways over there, far away, not in our own neighborhoods um, or in our own families per se, um, but with our purchasing power and with our choices to participate in global capitalism under neoliberalism, we are complicit in these forms of violence, whether we want to or not, whether we see them up close or not. So I appreciate how your book turns our lens to focus on this one specific situation at a large corporation because of the awareness it raise, raises about how interconnected our lives and livelihoods are across borders and boundaries. And this is sort of a whodunit book about the golpe at Ford, uh, but it also asks us at readers to think about our interconnectedness as workers in solidarity. Um, so thank you for bringing the reader uh, into that conversation. Um, I was struck at the beginning of reading and throughout the book by the alphabet soup of acronyms, which you handled in a way that allowed me to follow the narrative. Um, at the beginning of your book, you have um, a very helpful list that I referred back to every page, um, uh, definitions of the acronyms, which like in academia, where every committee, every department, every building and student group has acronyms as shorthand that can be confusing and exclusive to newcomers, um, you know, learning union history in the, in the Americas requir requires learning the language, learning the code, and your book does a great job of making that accessible. Um, uh, one quote um, from the book, page 148, just as an example, the workers had decided they needed to change their affiliation from the CTM to another legal federation affiliated with the PRI, the COR. And there you're referring to the Confederación de Trabajadores Mexicanos or the Confederation of Mexican Workers, the Partido Revolucionario Institucional or the Partido of the Democratic Revolution and the COR, Confederación de Obreros Revolucionarios, I believe, Confederation of Revolutionary Workers of Mexico. What a mouthful. And so without the many abbreviations that you had to use, your book would have required two volumes. Um, and so you bring us into learning that language of uh, labor in Mexico um, by using it. Um, I also really appreciated the way that you summarized key events in Mexican history um, and uh, giving definitions such as, for example, talking about maquiladoras on page 107, I found a really uh, helpful definition. A maquiladora is a subcontractor factory operation that imports materials and equipment on a duty-free and tariff-free basis for assembly, processing, or manufacturing, and then exports the assembled, processed, or manufactured products, sometimes back to the raw materials country of origin. Um, my understanding of maquiladoras um, and how those really uh, shaped culture in Mexico um, was from hearing family stories from my children's grandmother. Um, you see my son, Sam, coming and going. Um, yes. <laughs> she is a Mixtec woman um, who lived in Iztapalapa and Iztacalco in the Distrito Federal, state of Mexico, around Mexico City. And my son, Samuel, Samuel Guillermo, is named for his grandmother, Guillermina Riveros. Mm -hmm whom we never got to meet. Uh, she raised five children who were born in the span of six years. And then um, because of economics, she, was, uh, she went to work in a maquiladora after her third baby was born, which caused her to be separated many hours from her five young children, which led to tremendous health problems, especially for her third baby. Um, and similarly, when you wrote uh, the history of the Mexico City earthquake that called to mind some family stories of Samuel's father talking about um, his mom leaving the five kids to walk through the city to find her sister on the other side of town and, and walk, you know, there was no phone communication. It was like, you know, what happened on 9-11 um, in New York, trying, trying to locate family. So um, as a mother of a mixed immigration status family uh, for whom natural and man-made disasters and violence have sparked movement and caused separation in our family, um, I wanted to ask you about internal migration for work at the Coatitlan Ford plant and whether some workers move from agricultural settings or more rural parts of Mexico to, to take jobs um, in this Ford plant. Um, and I also wondered about the demographic and linguistic makeup of, of the workers at Ford and whether they came from indigenous backgrounds and from languages other than Spanish um, and how working at Ford affected their ability to carry on and pass along their cultural and linguistic heritage. If, you know, I wondered if any, if, if you know anything about that or if, if there's work done on that. Um, this is something certainly that happened in, in my kid's father's family 
their father never learned Mixtec or Mixteco. Um, and, um, you know, uh, the indigenous languages and cultures are, are hard to carry on um, in, in those sorts of circumstances. Um, let's see. Then um, I, I wanted to note that I think there are probably aspects of Mexican labor history and culture that would be hard to access for this project uh, without knowing Spanish. And I was amazed and, and so uh, impressed by uh, how deep into the story and, and how much research you were able to do. But I wondered if there were parts of the story that were hard for you to study or to include because of needing to rely on extant sources in English or paying translators, interpreters to work with you. And I wondered, um, if there were parts of the story you would tell if uh, if you had access uh, to, to primary sources. Building trust with sources, getting people to tell you their own stories can be a tremendous challenge, um, even if you do speak the same language or come from the same community. Um, but I wondered if there are Ford workers who remember El Golpe with whom you were able to have conversations or whether that might be a future project. Those are wonderful questions and no one's asked me that type of question before so I, I really it's interesting uh I, I would i have to start out by saying you know i i knew no spanish i took community ed courses for two years and worked at it really hard until i started the manuscript and i stopped but i could do emails in spanish with a dictionary so that helped a lot and then i uh professor patrick mcnamara at the university of minnesota took me under my his wing and he sat down and spent i don't know hour after hour talking to me about Mexico and what he thought happened and let me audit his classes in Mexican history. And he had a graduate student named Paula Cuellar Cuellar who did a tremendous amount of work. She was going to Mexico City in the summer of 2018. And she, if I would, could find the contact information, she would contact and interview people for me. And she spent a lot of hours at her own time doing those interviews and translating and working at a dirt cheap price, I'd have to say. So as somebody who believed in what I was doing. And not only that, if I had been able to hire somebody professionally to do that, I don't think it would have worked. I mean, I knew from the cables that the Revolutionary Workers Party had been involved. And that's what I thought set the CIA off there. I needed to get someone to talk about that. And they were very reluctant, for good reason, to talk about that. But they trusted Paula and eventually opened up. And uh, one individual gave me like a five-hour interview about the Revolutionary Workers Party. Now, the one thing I could not get from them was their own personal history, because like the questions you asked, I wondered too, how many of them were indigenous? How many of them had come from some place like Oaxaca and had kind of a revolution? I don't know. And nobody would talk about their own personal stories at mm -hmm. all. I think a number of these guys were probably had, had a student radical background and were organizing the plant, though I don't know that. But there, these are, you know, some of these are some brilliant guys. Some of these guys, the stuff they did there is really incredible organizing, as good as anything I've ever read in history, really, with what they were up against. So there were a lot of things I could have done better. I mean, the newspapers you mentioned, there's a lot of stuff in the newspapers that I just didn't have the ability either to get or really go over carefully. Now, the thing that helped me there, a guy named Don, Dan Labatz wrote a book in 1992 called Mask of Democracy. And that book is based largely on the newspapers. So he preserved a great deal of information in that book that I would not have known about if he hadn't have done that. But I also had problems with the newspapers in Mexico City. And since we're a, a close group here, I, I will say this. I, I knew there had to be photos from the accounts that I researched. They would say, well, journalists was there. In those days, they sent photographers when they sent journalists. So Paula really worked hard and I gave her a list and she found 50 thumbprints, a marvelous photographic history of what happened there. I could not get La Hernada permission to print those. And I spent a lot of time, I didn't know what was going on. The last negotiator, I took over negotiations myself because I thought somebody was crooked in the chain. They were asking for so much money. They wanted $460 a photo to, to publish. So that's like, you know, I paid the Ruther Archive 70, I think. I mean, a way, the price to a price I couldn't afford. I still got the thumbprints, but I think La Hernada shows up in the story 
they printed an article, a letter to the editor from Wallace de la Mancha, this gangster mm. on Wednesday after the attack was Monday morning, denying he was involved. Well, it wouldn't even, the press reports wouldn't even come in the paper until Tuesday. And then the next day they have a letter from him denying it. So I think they had, and they knew he had killed two of their reporters previously and other strikes that same year. That's so, and I would have really liked to research those strikes because they all happened after the election. Wallace de la Mancha was involved and it involved this same kind of paramilitary operation against strikes and dissidents. I did not have the ability to do any research on that. And so I don't mention them in the, the text, but I, I, there's a lot more that could have been researched, as you say. And if I'd had, if I knew I was going to do this, I would have started studying Spanish a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's never too late. You yeah, it isn't. Class. And it sounds like you've already <laughs> done quite a bit. A couple, you've got a, definitely a couple of years of Spanish. I did, I did. Um, yeah. And these record. dictionaries now are not too bad, you know, yeah. these electronic dictionaries. We have good tools now, yes, that you can yeah. do a lot with, and Google translators, Google Translate and that aren't perfect. Yeah, that's gotten better since they started doing that too. Yeah, yeah. It, you can't publish it like that, but you can definitely figure out what you're looking at. So yeah, yeah. technology is, is really a helpful tool. Um, I have a couple more uh, points that I wanted to. So I wanted to note the very moving depictions of solidarity in your book and ask you to highlight those. Um, on page 126, the wives of the fired executive committee members um, that you talked about with your PowerPoint um, came to the plant with cookie jars and asked for do donations uh, for the movement and the courage displayed by the women in publicly standing up to Ford and the CTM emboldened many workers. And then um, that was followed by a hunger strike by two of the fired executive committee members, which was no small hunger strike. They, you go into detail about the effects on the body, but their hunger strike lasted 38 days. And we know from reading about Cesar Chavez about the effectiveness of hunger strikes, but also of, about the detrimental effects. Um, and then during the occupation of the plant, uh, messages of solidarity began to pour into the plant from other unions and workers at different factories Teachers with preschool children came to the faculty fa uh, to the factory and gave their lunches to the workers. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so, I wanted to ask you to speak about the importance of uh, family and community support in solidarity. Um, just as we've seen in our community with the Minneapolis public school teachers on strike, um, fighting for a living wage and de decent working conditions and learning conditions for our children, um, it's so important. I think as a community that we think about solidarity. Um, and uh, its effectiveness in, in um, making a difference. Yeah, I, and you know what, in the interviews with the, the people who'd been involved in this, they really emphasize some of those things. The, the women taking up the contributions, they credit that with saving the whole struggle. And I, I, you know, it's hard for me to emphasize that as much as they did in the interviews in the book, but they really credit that as having a huge role. Now, the other thing that I found really fascinating about the, the families was it, it, they called the radio and told them the plant had been attacked and that they were occupying it. The Ford security people locked the gates and ran away as did all the management. So we had these wounded workers inside the plant and the gates locked, the ambulances couldn't get in. The wives heard about it on the radio and came down and heave ho, heave ho and shoved down the fence so everybody could get in. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, you know, again, people bringing their lunch, those are the things these guys remember after 30 years, you know, of all the stuff they were through getting their lives threatened and everything. Those are the type of things that they remember and really emphasized in the, in the interviews. So you really picked up on that. It doesn't take up that much space, but those things really meant a lot to those people. Yeah, I'm sure. And that kept them going when they were probably like ready to give up on, on uh, yeah. what they were standing for. Um, you end your book with a summary of what happened uh, with El Golpe and the strike. Um, Pages 196 to 202 near the end of the book is a retelling of what happened uh, in, in those days. 
and serves, I think, as a kind of closing argument of this almost legal case in which you rule out various power structures and forces that might have been involved in orchestrating the coup and organizing and hiring um, uh, the golpeadores or doing the, um, the, the intellectual authors of uh, what wrought havoc at the Ford plant um, kidnapping and injuring ten uh, injuring ten workers and killing Pleto Nigrino Urbina. You mentioned several times in the book that there's no statute of limitations for his being killed, um, and I wonder. Um, I, I I think that we would join the Mexican people and and the workers at Ford in wanting to see justice for him and his family. Um, uh, I know you mentioned with the the difficulty of doing this research it might be very difficult to, to ever see justice, but I wonder if there's any chance of that. And also um, uh, having heard stories about activists in our own community who've been targeted by the authorities for speaking up about corruption or questioning and calling out violent abuse of power. Um, if you had apprehensions about the CIA surveilling or targeting you for your work on this project, not just um, your career now that you're retired, um, but this is a very brave project, um, and I uh, I wondered if if you have at, at any point had thoughts for your own safety um, as you're working on this book because it's really a courageous uh, undertaking. So I wanted to thank you for sharing your extensive research and making the story accessible uh, to all readers, and to urge the audience to buy the book and read it, <laughs> um, and to read it, support this project, raise awareness. But I wondered if there's anything, Rob, that you would want your audience to do um, if there's a call to action beyond reading and raising our own awareness and knowing what happened there. So thank you so much for, for including me and letting me read your book. Well, thank you for so much for reading it and participating. i start off the last, I should have written some of these things down there. I was, um, I, if what people can do, you know, there is a new labor federation called Senitia. I'm sure a lot of people in this Zoom have heard of it. It's a labor federation that won a union election and defeated the CTM at the GM plant in Salao, Mexico. And they also, a few weeks ago, won another one at a big parts depot in Matamoros. There are some people, there is one guy who was a leader at Ford Quetitlan that's an advisor to this group. Yeah. There's another guy who was, that my initial research in Mexico, who is a, a member of this group. So I think this is a, a wonderful organization that shows a lot of promise. And the, uh, Labor Notes has posted links where you can contribute directly to them through the Act Blue charity. And I've contributed to them because I, I think there's really a reason to be hopeful about what they're doing. Um, a lot of the forces that helped defeat them in 1990 are now supporting, including the US government. I mean, the, Biden came out and said he wanted to see a fair election at GM Slough, or whoever his representative was, US Trade Representative. The AFL-CIO came out and said, well, we want to see a fair election there. And the Solidarity Center is sending resources down there to this independent union federation. And I believe what has changed is now this administration sees that this pool of super cheap labor on the border is a destabilizing factor in US politics, which it is. I mean, what I saw was, you know, the deunionization, deindustrialization of America, not only our own Ford plant, I worked as a regional servicing rep, closed down three other plants and half of another one. Terrible toll this took on people and communities. The only thing that would have made that any better was helping these Mexicans improve their wages and conditions. And we didn't do it in 1990. So let's hope that we're doing that now. Um, you asked me several questions there. Is there anything else I should have responded to? I should have written those down, but. I put them in the chat. In the chat. I was asking yes. about solidarity, the importance of solidarity movements. And I think in your call to action, I think yes. you're, you're inviting us yeah. into that. And then about justice for the killing of the worker. Yeah, I, 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 that's something that I don't know enough about internal Mexican politics to judge whether that will ever happen, whether he'll get justice. But I really would like to see justice for all these workers who were fired and deprived from the actions of the US is responsible for in one way or another. Um, 
so yeah, I think there's a chance that they can get justice. I think a victory of Senatia would be uh, some justice for them. And I think the international solidarity, you know, I mean, last year, unions lost another 240,000 members in the US. And this is, you know, we had striketober and there's always some things going on in labor, exciting things, but we continue to contract. Even when there's, you know, some local fights that uh, turn out well. But I think labor has to embrace international solidarity to be successful. It just can't succeed without doing that. And to do that really has to confront what this past was. And it's very difficult. Uh, I know they don't want to. They, they've made that very clear to me that this is a taboo subject and they're not going to talk about it. Now, the issue of the CIA, one of the things that's really bothered me it was so little had been written about this and there's stuff out there. I mean, it's not like, it's been like every rock I picked up, there's something underneath it. Why haven't any, you know, real historians dealt with this? And there's a bit here, a bit there, but to put it out and say labor, what have you been doing really hasn't been done. So, you know, I, uh, you know, I'm 70 years old. I, you know, I guess I don't really have that much concern about something happened to me. There have been some strange things that have happened in this. Uh, and I hate to even go into details because people look at me like, you must be crazy. No, I'm not. I could prove some of these bizarre things like my email getting hacked and some things like that. But, you know, I got the book out and there's really, you know, I mean, that was, I was happy to get this far because once I've made it this far, well, now someone's going to have to deal with what I said there. And if somebody thinks I'm completely off base or my research is no good, or I would appreciate hearing it because I couldn't get anybody who would respond to me via email that would say that. So. Great. Rob, I wonder if, if I could direct us back uh, to the years immediately after uh, these events and the way that, and Joe said a little bit about this, the way that UAW 879 responded to NAFTA. And, you know, we're, we're at a point now after four years of Trump and, and the kind of political discourse in the United States um, that we would expect a kind of nativist, nationalist, anti-Mexican discourse in the labor movement in response to NAFTA. And yet UAW Local 879 led or precipitated, whatever the right verb is, an effort to build transnational labor solidarity in the face of NAFTA. Rather than saying, let's have protective tariffs, Let's, let's make sure that Mexican goods don't get into the United States. UAW 879 said, let's organize together across Canada, the US and Mexico. And that was an incredibly powerful principled stand. And, and I worry that that's being forgotten, that that, that actually was possible in that moment, and not just as the choice of a couple of union leaders, but as something that percolated in the rank and file and made sense to people. And I wonder if you and, and maybe Joe wants to weigh in a little bit about how that happened in 93, 94, 95, um, that, that put transnational labor solidarity ahead of nationalism as a way to respond to the changing global economy. So what I, what I think is that, you know, we've both recently seen the uh, $4 a day, no way, join hands across the border documentary that's on YouTube. I suppose most yes. of the people here have, if they haven't, it's a 20 minute thing with Peter and I just saw for the first time now, yes. 30 years after it was made, <laughs> right. but it, it's excellent. And if you, if you see that Ted LaValle says almost everybody in the plant wore black armbands 
for the Cleto Nemo Memorial Day. The yep. thing was, this was not that unpopular among the membership. Uh, that they recognized that those super low paid jobs were a threat and they supported helping the, the Mexicans raise their wages. So what was missing at that time was any union leadership yeah. that would push in that way. Our local, the only locals who did anything were the dissident locals mm -hmm. who didn't really care what the international union said. But if the national union had said, listen, you need to support these guys, there would have been a big movement to do that. The problem was they were involved in helping the other side. So I think what's really been miss missing is leadership that's willing to step up with this. I think most unions now see that this is important to support unions in Mexico. I, I don't know, but because again, there's a big MAGA nationalist answer to this, yeah. which treats the Mexican workers as enemies stealing our jobs. And it's not gonna be any benefit to anybody. So. I think the tide is starting to turn on it. It's just a shame that we had to lose 50,000 factories to low wage countries before this turn came. Thank you, Joe, anything you wanna add? Well, I don't think uh, our local initiated the, the conference that we went to in 1993. I, I, I believe that was somebody else, maybe labor and oats type people in Detroit or somebody who P. Kelly, I think. That, but we had oh, an interest in it and, and uh, went there. And it was, a, it was a modest thing. There wasn't a lot, whole lot of, of uh, auto workers from the US and Canada or Mexico there, but there was some people there. And I felt uh, as you, you were saying uh, that, it, that it was uh, a very positive uh, concept that needed to be, uh, to happen more. I, before I came to Twin Cities, I lived in uh, Toledo, Ohio. I can remember going to Labor Day parades in <clears throat> Detroit, where they would have a uh, flow with, with a Japanese car and somebody, people smashing it with sledgehammers. I mean, the, the UAW was doing that. So that's pretty bad, uh, I think. I mean, it, uh, it only a one step away from Vincent Chen, who was a, he was a Chinese American in Detroit, who was murdered by a uh, Chrysler foreman and his son, who was a Chrysler worker, who thought he was Japanese and was res responsible for loss of jobs in the United States. But uh, so, so, yeah, uh, the labor movement needs to, to it, it's a struggle trying to, to, to uh, build that kind of international solidarity because there is a certain extent, I mean, the, these companies do uh, transfer jobs to, to low wage places, even within the United States. Uh, they deal with things like move, moving a factory to the South or somewhere where there's uh, not number of unions and then uh, globalizing, uh, it, it, it's going to be a real challenge to, to, for workers to, to uh, fight together and um, modest steps like that, like the solidarity that there was with the Quatitlan workers, uh, who, I mean, <clears throat> I would say to Sarah, I mean, the, 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 that plant is close to Mexico City. So, I mean, there could be indigenous people there and stuff, but it, it, it's kind of in a urban location there. Uh, Mexico City is what, 10 million people or something like that? Uh, yeah. So let me suggest that we go to the full gallery um, and everybody who would like to participate, please, uh, Bailey, if you can allow them all to unmute. And um, we had had a question from uh, Jenny, Jenny, if you're still there, do you want to ask your question? Can we make these adjustments? Jenny, did you want to ask your question? You'd prefer to stay muted. 
let me let me scroll up and find it. Hang on. Jenny, here we are. Your point about Ford. Well, was there not an earlier? Here we go. So maybe I'm making this more complicated than I need to. Chad Pearson, you still with us? You want to ask your question? Certainly. Um, I really enjoyed your talk and the commentators. Uh, very interesting. What a compelling book. Um, my question is about um, you know, folks who you knew who are no longer speaking with you. Early on, you said that during your presentation. And I'm curious if it's because this is a topic that makes them uncomfortable or if somehow they have something to do with these events. Um, I don't know if you feel comfortable answering oh, that. No, I, interesting. I, I, I'm happy to talk about it. These are people who are employed as staff people or officers of unions who've had their job threatened. They've been told not to talk to me. I mean, some of them will still secretly say happy birthday on Facebook, but even their Facebook pages <laughs> are monitored by their bosses. Uh, some of the documents that I got leaked out, well, that I got, they can't, the AFL-CIO knows I have them and they can't figure out who I got them. So I mean, the I, I mean, there's people who won't even get 30 feet near me, so they don't want to be accused of giving me information. So these are people who are friends, really. And I, I know where they're at and I know what's going on. So, I, you know, I take it in stride. How do we make sense of this? Is this, I mean, the AFL-CIO leadership, uh, is this a source of embarrassment for them? Um, is this something they continue to engage in these sorts of international shenanigans and they believe in it? I mean, I just... You know, people get into the union movement, they get into labor for social justice reasons, right? And this is, goes totally against that spirit. Yeah, a lot of people get involved. And other people get involved for other reasons. But I, you know, I think that they were embarrassed about this. Now, I, I was told they were embarrassed about this, but they finally agreed to let me into the files on this. But I've spent so long trying to find out what AFELD was, then I had all sorts of questions about the CIA and what was the CIA doing? And have we ever publicly commented on this? And after I wrote that letter to Trump, got, no one ever said a word to me about anything. And that's really what they don't wanna deal with is this 40 year history of cooperating with the CIA and then covering it up. So then it also raises questions about exactly what's going on today. So there's points where there were breaks, getting rid of Lane Kirkland, was a break. I mean, Lane Kirkland, I did some research on him, which was very difficult. And I know I've got enough controversy in this book, but, I, and I don't say this in the book, but I think he was likely an intelligence agent. I, I don't see how you can get to any other conclusion from what his genuine background was. So I, I'll just talk about that for a moment. He was from the Southern planter aristocracy in South Carolina. His great, great grandfather was had 160 slaves in the 1860 census, joined the Confederate cavalry, was killed in battle. Harriet Tubman led a convoy when she was moving through the area with Sherman, freed the slaves from the Kirkland Foundation. That was his father's side. His mother's side, his great-grandfather was a provisional government, provisional Confederate government, signed the Articles of Secession. I said, well, that's pretty heavy background. Lane must have really broken with that. No, he never did. He referred to the Civil War as the War of Negr Northern Aggression throughout his life. So he went to, he was in the, he took a training course to be a, on the Merchant Marine, spent most of World War II as a deck officer in the Merchant Marine. When he got out, he went to work for the Navy in Washington, started going to Georgetown at night, very quickly switched to a full-time class at Georgetown even though he didn't have GI Bill, Merchant Marine didn't have GI Bill. And his biographer was really a super conservative guy when I found this biography, he said he took a special class for students entered interested in foreign affairs. Uh, no explanation of why he did this. His, his very sympathetic biography says, as soon as he got out, he went to work for the AFL and stayed there the rest of his life. 
So I have questions about exactly who this guy was. So anyway, these are the kind of things they do not want to talk about because they haven't got answers. The reason I started looking at Lane Kirkland is because he appointed Irving Brown International Affairs Director in 1982. I, I, in my footnote on Brown, I list eight sources saying he was a CIA agent, a career CIA agent. Five of them were former CIA agents themselves. There's a video of a former CIA agent named Paul Sakwa saying he told Meany that Brown was CIA. This is on a YouTube documentary that was, was broadcast on PBS in 1980 called uh, On Company Business. So they've got a lot they're trying to cover up here. I don't even think they know where to start because you really would have to make a clean break. All the archives that would relate to this, International Affairs Department, AFELD, all close to researchers. Uh, and they, they'll occasionally let somebody into something when they know they're gonna write something positive and they're sure there's nothing that's gonna embarrass them. So those need to be opened up. And we've got a, the AFL-CIO has a Kirkland Meany Human Rights Award, which they give out every year. This is a mockery of history. Any way you look at it, you cannot defend that action. So there's change that has to happen in the AFL-CIO if they're going to move forward. And I haven't seen any sign yet that they're ready to do that. I hope that was too, not too long an answer to that question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, right. Would Peter, somebody, can, I, please, can I say Brock, something really yes, quick? Yes, please, brother. Yeah, I, I think one, one of the things when what, what happens in the labor movement, and, you know, I've been in the labor movement now uh, for a little bit over 20 years, is that uh, I think more than an, more than embarrassment, it, it is really more about omitting history, that if you ignore it, you know, it goes away and, and that way nobody will question you. But one, one of the reasons why I love where I, where I work right now is a, uh, yeah, we, we admit that there were some mistakes that were, that were made in the past and that there were some shady characters that they shouldn't be there and most of them were punished for what they did. But yeah, that's the history and there's nothing we can do about history. But the only thing that we can do is actually make it better. Exactly right. I couldn't have said it better. Yeah. Anyone else? Questions? Comments? Molly, please. If um, I could just make, yeah, go ahead, uh, Will, Molly. Go ahead. Go ahead, Molly. No, I was just going to say, I, I don't know that I have questions, but uh, thank you so much, Rob, for this fantastic very intriguing book. Um, I retired some years ago. I was doing a lot of things with social services and the health healthcare. And the only union that I've ever belonged to for many decades was the musicians union, but I've always kept abreast of the situation. And in the 80s and the 90s, I, I was involved with the Nicaragua Solidarity Committee and the Resource Center for the Americas. So that's when I you know, besides my years in college, you know, I found out about so much of the CIA, CIA intervention. So I have to say I wasn't shocked, but I was somewhat surprised that they were so involved with the labor movement. But this has been so intriguing. This was fantastic. So thank you so much. Yeah, and I just, I, several of you were involved in the, the 1980 Central America movement. I, when I started researching that, Minnesota really had quite a role and has a lot to be proud of, of what people did in the 1980s on Central America. I, I believe, and I got this from the union advocate, it was the first state federation to pass a motion against aid to the Contras. And that was a fight. Uh, yeah, that's something to be proud of. And I look at all the things rank and file people were doing to push that forward. It's a lot different than today. I mean, you could see the labor movement, even in terms of that energy and initiative that was there is, is missing nowadays. And it's so important to what happened. So Adam, you wanna ask your question, please? Oh, sure. Uh, hi, uh, just to introduce myself. My name's Adam. Um, I've been involved in the labor movement my entire adult life. And 
Um, I was really excited to be a part of this talk and I actually ordered the book. So I'm very much looking forward to reading it. And um, I'm actually doing a project of my own as far as um, the labor movement is concerned. And I'm really interested in institutionalization of the labor movement, um, the history as far as how labor in the United States went from being something that was very radical and militant and organic to being something that's been so co-opted and institutionalized. And so um, my question was, and I'll just read it off of the chat. Um, in your research, um, have you discovered any connections or potential connections between the post-World War II American labor movement as, as far as its sort of shift to the right, becoming more conservative, um, the CIA or other intelligence agencies and projects like, I mean, we know about chaos and the counterintelligence uh, project, all these different things that were going on that were infiltrations of, of left-wing and labor movements. Um, and then, of course, the what I call the AFL-CIA uh, movements abroad and in sort of the breaking down or destruction of independent radical left-wing labor movements elsewhere, Latin America, France, Italy, et cetera. So thank you. Yeah, I actually quite a bit of the book deals with those kind of issues. And I'll just pick one of them out, which I found really interesting, which was the Jay Lovestone story. And I mean, he was, I mean, there is a really wonderful biography of him called A Covert Life, but just to kind of, you mentioned Operation Chaos. So he formed a close personal relationship with James Angleton, who was in charge of Operation Chaos, and H.T. Lengwell, which was the reading mail of Americans. So they intercepted mail of Americans in New York, steamed it open, and read it. So they did this for thousands of people for from, I think, the late 50s until the early 70s. The postmaster finally got nervous and, and stopped it. And one of those who had his mail read was Victor Ruther. But so that was Angleton's story. And of course, Angleton is a person of interest in the Kennedy assassination. He, uh, yeah. There's no question now that he, he had the control of files on Lee Harvey Oswald for four years. And he, he lied to the Warren Commission about that. So that was probably what he, one of the things he's most famous for. But anyway, he knew he needed information about the US labor movement. So he became very close to Angleton at some point in the 60s, started paying him. And they became so personally close. So you can see that they're both kind of very well-educated, super smart guys who thought they were really the only ones who knew how to fight communism. So when Lovestone, he kept his office, meaning he let him keep his office in New York. But when he went to uh, Washington, he stayed in Angleton's home in Washington, DC. That's how close they were. And I, I just another thing on the general topic of what you mentioned there was, I mean, I know a very famous event for my life was when the, the hard hats beat up the anti-war protesters in New York City. That was 1970, Peter, was that? Yeah. Lovestone was one of the people who helped organize the, the hard hats to do that. And here he was certainly in the pay of the CIA at the time he did that. And so that just goes to show you there were a lot of things going on that still need to be researched, still need to be looked at, like what happened here and why did this happen? So yeah. big topic, a lot of the book is on, on that, on the labor, the CIA, especially overseas, because what AFL did was specialize in destabilizing governments. So I looked at three democratic governments that were overthrown in coups and replaced by military dictatorships. And AFELD played, so here we are fighting communism, authoritarian communism, overthrowing democratic left of center governments and getting military hunters in. And AFELD really was good at doing that, at, de at destabilizing through labor, these governments. So, um... We are running out of time. Um, I want to just tell one story as kind of a counterbalance or a palate cleanser. Or, um, and this is another UAW 879 uh, story. Um, so in uh, the winter of 1986, probably February or March, in the still the heat of the Hormel strike, uh, a guest came to a mass meeting at the UAW Hall uh, named Amon Masane, 
who was the chief shop steward at the 3M plant in Johannesburg, South Africa, um, where workers in Johannesburg had just engaged in a wildcat solidarity strike showing support for 3M workers in Freehold, New Jersey, who were fighting against their plant being closed. So imagine workers in South Africa, this is still the height of the apartheid regime, having an illegal wildcat strike to show support for American workers. Um, and the workers in Freehold had been, they were members of oil chemical and atomic workers. They were connected with Tony Mazaki, who was connected with Victor Ruther. Um, and they had been inspired by no less than Bruce Springsteen, who had written a song uh, called My Hometown, which was about freehold. And the slogan of the struggle had become uh, 3M, don't abandon my hometown, freehold New Jersey. And Amon brought a video to share with us of the workers pouring out of the 3M plant in Johannesburg, all wearing t-shirts that said, 3M don't abandon my hometown, Freehold, New Jersey. They then took down the American flag and the 3M flag that were on flagpoles at the plant. They didn't know if they would be massacred, arrested, fired. And he had come to the United States to tell this story and to ask for solidarity with the workers in New Jersey and with the workers in, in Johannesburg. He then went to Austin, Minnesota to do a similar presentation to strikers uh, in local P9 and was given a cram your spam t-shirt, which he brought back to South Africa and it was smuggled into uh, the Robben Island prison for Nelson Mandela to wear. These are the kinds of transnational labor solidarity that are possible and not just possible because some romantic or academic or intellectual dreams them up, they actually happened. And the kind of story that Rob is talking about and has written about, there is all of these evil machinations on the part of the CIA and AFELD and the labor bureaucrats and, you know, but there is also the express solidarity by workers themselves. And, and I don't, I mean, that's what keeps me going. I'm sure it keeps a lot of us going. We should never lose sight of it. Even, and maybe even more so in a period now where um, the labor movement is such a small slice of, of what it once was. Frank Hammer, I'm gonna let, let you have the last point, please. Hi, good afternoon. Hello, Peter, thank you. Sure. And, um, I wanna thank Rob for uh, this masterful uh, investigation that he pursued and shared with us. Um, it's gonna have a lot of ripple effects. And I think many of them are going to be very positive in terms of waking up uh, the movement activists and movement movements within the labor movement. I wanted to just add on, I wanted to pick up on what you were saying that in reference to the Cynthia Independent Union that just got uh, overwhelming support from the GM workers in Salau and who are currently in negotiations with General Motors for a different kind of contract than what CTM uh, uh, attempted to deliver a year or so ago and that the workers rejected not once but twice, first the first time in a fraudulent vote and then the second time in a, in a clean vote. And what I wanted to mention is that during the GM strike, 
in 2019, the 40 day strike, which doesn't get a lot of notice uh, about, about that strike, that Cynthia workers, or sorry, pre Cynthia uh, workers, rank and file workers engaged in acts of solidarity with the GM stri strikers in the US by refusing uh, overtime and protesting the speed up because GM was trying to compensate for the loss of production in the, in the uh, Salau facility and several of them were fired. And uh, there's no doubt that now Cynthia will be negotiating for the return to uh, work of those fired strikers uh, that GM uh, perpetrated against its Salau workers. So uh, absolutely uh, the notions of solidarity um, run strong, even though maybe unnoticed, they're there. Thank you. Thank you, well, Frank. Frank is in the book. So if <laughs> anyone wants to read, he, him and his brother, who was an AFELD employee who was murdered in El Salvador in 1981. So, wow. Wow. so I, I just want to close by mentioning that um, we have a number of great conversations coming up in the virtual world of the East Side Freedom Library. Um, we're going to be having a conversation uh, with historian Chad Montry on April 6th uh, for his book, Whiteness in Plain View, um, about Minnesota. Uh, we're going to have a conversation on April 7th with Joe Burns and his new book, Class Struggle Unionism. And we're going to have a conversation on April 11th with Daisy Pitkin and her new book, On the Line, about organizing Latinx industrial laundry workers in Arizona in the early 2000s. So um, join us again. It's so great uh, that you took time from a Sunday uh, to be part of this conversation. Rob, thank you for so many things, uh, including giving us a reason to have this conversation uh, today. Um, and uh, just thank you all. Let's stay well and stay in touch and build transnational labor solidarity in response to all of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Rob, thank you. Last, any parting comment? Uh, no, I think you summed things up very well with that story about uh, South Africa. I had not heard that before, so. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> See, if we don't write about this stuff, people won't know. That's right. We all got a responsibility. <clears throat> all right. Take good care. Thank you.